we're talking about a pretty fearsome amount of fuel we use. Just gasoline alone, we're looking at 160 billion gallons a year. And this number is going to come up a lot in what we talk about. So that's what we got to replace if we're going to replace oil. There's a lot of reasons to replace oil, but let's talk a little bit about history. Alcohol was a very popular fuel in the United States in the 1800s before cars were ever invented. We produced millions of gallons of alcohol for lighting homes and street lighting and for some for heating. Alcohol lamps were the standard way people lit their homes in the 1800s. It was alcohol with a little bit of turpentine in it, which you can tap from trees just like maple syrup. And I gave it a nice bright light and it was a very clean burning fuel. Um, the other things people use were animal fat or beeswax for light, and you know those are a little less clean. They make soot, etc. Later on, um, kerosene came into existence with the, with the discovery of oil, and it replaced alcohol because it was cheaper to produce. But of course, it was nowhere near as clean. History books always talk about we went somewhere from animal fat candles to petroleum in one step, and that wasn't true. The city of Cincinnati used to grind and ferment 12,000 bushels a day of corn just for street lights, to make alcohol for street lights. So we have a long history with, of making alcohol here. When it comes to the internal combustion engine, the first one that was used in an automobile was by a guy named Nick, Nicholas Otto, and that's not A-U-T-O, that's O-T-T-O, and he used alcohol as his fuel in the first, in first uh, internal combustion engine car. Internal combustion engines have been around longer and used in industrial settings like in mines, etc. With and they use coal gas and that kind of stuff. But when it was first used as a vehicle, alcohol was the only fuel that was available. Petroleum, you know, petroleum hadn't really been invented yet. That came a little later. So the Model A, Henry Ford's Model A, um, ran on alcohol or gasoline. By the time you know mass-produced cars came out, there was some oil turning into gasoline. And what that was, was the byproduct of the heating and lighting industry that Rockefeller started. So the stuff that was too volatile to put in oil lamps, because they'd explode and be like Molotov cocktail time, Rockefeller at night would dump into rivers when nobody was looking, basically throwing away all the volatile components of, of oil because nobody wanted them. Well, figuring out how to make it run in a car, then you got some income from it versus it being a waste product. and being a clever businessman, he, he made that possible in cities. So he started having places you could buy gasoline in cities. So the Model A ran on both alcohol and gasoline because there was more alcohol available than there was gasoline when the car was first built. If you went out in the countryside from the city and started getting low on fuel, you stopped by almost any farm and you could get distilled liquor, Applejack basically, which you could put in the car and the Model A was a dual fuel vehicle. You could adjust from one fuel to the other from inside the cab. Didn't have to get out under the hood at all. Anybody here ever have a Model A or a Model T? Okay, so tell me about the choke. It's been a while. That's the distributor. Yeah, the advanced. The knob on the dash. Right. Well, the knob on the dash, okay, was not truly a choke. What a choke does is it, it, it closes a flap that restricts the air coming into what used to we used to have on cars carburetors. But this wasn't that at all. This was a long rod that went right down to the carburetor and you actually adjusted the fuel air mixture with the knob on the dash. So alcohol needed less air than gasoline. So you had to change the air fuel mixture. And the other thing you did is you adjusted the um, digital distributor. That digital distributors back in the early part of the 1900s. It took five digits, so you had to go ahead and do it yourself. You know, it jumped ahead a little bit in history from back in the 1910s to Granger's and jumped up to there. There's something that happened in the, in the middle. And that was Rockefeller deciding not to compete anymore with alcohol. So he went and found a group that had been around since 1854, I think it was, the Women's Christian Temperance Movement. <laughs> And he went to them with one of his you know, charity fronts, and he gave them $4 million. And he told them what to do. He said, I want you to make sure that alcoholism is produced in this country. And they said, that's our mission. Now, imagine 1913, I think it was, at the time when this was going on, 1913 to 15, when all this was happening. You've got an all-male Congress, hard-drinking Congress, 
and somehow they voted for a constitutional amendment. This is not a normal bill. This is like two-thirds of all of Congress has to vote on this, not to ban the drinking of alcohol, but the produ production of alcohol for any purpose. So that became known as prohibition. And that went on for about 13 years, during which time Rockefeller consolidated his hold on uh, both Europe and America in terms of fuel. Uh, he wasn't successful in getting prohibition passed anywhere else in the world, but he tried. And that's all, this is all very well documented. $4 million back at that era would be the equivalent of $60 million today. Can you buy Congress for $60 million? Not a problem. You can even do it today with today's dollars, but you're worthless. So people are asking about you know, politics. You know, everything about fuel has to do with politics, and it has to do with who gets the money. And we're going to be talking more about that. But let's kind of move ahead. So let's go ahead and get into into the alcohol itself. You know a little bit about the history now. Um, how is alcohol made? Well, it starts with photosynthesis. Plants are unique compared to animals because they can make food from the sun. They take solar energy, mix it with carbon dioxide from the air and water, and that is made into sugar, which is a carbohydrate, right? Carbon, carbon dioxide, hydrate, water. So carbohydrates are made by plants using sunlight. So when we ferment carbohydrates, sugar, we feed it to yeast, just like making wine or beer, and the yeast eat the sugar, and they breathe out not to make, because none of the costs of making alcohol went up, so the price stayed pretty much the same. The government did a little bit of controlling of the price. And so people started going up to the pump saying, well, why don't you put some of that and some of this in my car, and let's see what happens. And that's how they discovered that cars would run 50% on alcohol, is by doing what they call Robo de Gallo, which is making a cocktail in their tank. So, um, so we knew this in the 80s when I was working on alcohol before this was going on in Brazil. At that point, though, in the 80s, I started writing about this, so did a lot of other people. You know, we were saying, hey, you know, 20 years from now, maybe 2003, maybe 2000, we're going to hit the peak of oil. GM is warning, warning Congress, putting in very solemn studies saying, pay attention, we're going to start running out of oil in about 20 years. So everyone knew that we were going to run out of oil. But in 1980, what happened in our government? Well, Ronald Reagan was half of it. What's the other half? George Bush Sr., the father of the current president, for those of you who are too young to know what this hero was about. So for 12 years, we had George Bush as president with Ronald Reagan as kind of his talking puppet on the side, you know. So we had the oil companies in charge of the government for 12 years. Two Reagan and Bush terms and then Bush and Quayle. So during that time, any mention of alternative fuel basically was laughed at and not funded and didn't go anywhere. And we just wasted those 12 years doing nothing. Um, okay, so you know a little bit about how alcohol is made now. And you know a little bit about how the politics work in, in multiple countries about it.